But God is bigger, right? He's bigger than all the evil plots and plans that man come up with to take out his witness. And as we see this morning, the Lord is able to preserve. So let's first note two things. We're going to note how this plan came about. There, there are issues to kill Paul. And then how God came and unraveled the whole thing before their eyes. And it's, it's definitely needful for us. Let's start with a word of prayer and we're going to dive into our text. Lord, thanks for your grace upon us and your word that we have here before us. We pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to see your heart for us. That you would encourage those who are maybe struggling this morning with the trials and issues that are so overwhelming in their life. That, Lord, you would remind us once again, Jesus, that you are always in control. You love us. You hold us in your hands. Let your peace that passes understanding guard our heart and our minds in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Chapter 20. Three. We're going to start in verse 12 as we pick it up. Paul has been arrested. Remember, he came to Jerusalem with the gift. The lynch mob came and attacked him. And the commander intervened and saved him, put him in prison. The next day, they call the Sanhedrin, kind of the Congress of the Jews. And uh, he stands before them, Paul does, and says, on account of the resurrection, I'm being tried. And of course, Paul knew that the Congress, so to speak, the Sanhedrin was made up of those who believed in the resurrection, the Pharisees, and those who didn't, the Sadducees. And so it caused this great contention, and the commander puts him back in jail. The Lord speaks to Paul in that night, encourages his heart. I'm not done with you, Paul. We're going to get to Rome. And verse 12 says there, then on the following day, um, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. And so the word banded means really to unite together, to unite together by twisting together. And really, you've got these men with twisted hearts that are coming up with a twisted plan of foolishness and they think, hey, here's the deal. We are not eating until Paul is dead. And there's part of me that looks at it and goes, hunger strikes are really kind of foolish vows because they really don't affect anybody else but you. Oh, yeah, I'll show you. I won't eat dinner. More power to you, kid. See you in the morning. That's how you kind of feel. You know, <laughs> let's see how this plays out is kind of what you want to think. Really? These guys are under a serious oath. When I was in Bible college, we me and a couple of buddies made this stupid kind of hunger strike vow thing because we think we know everything at that age. And we get in there and we didn't like that the dean was charging us. We were working uh, in between the semesters. We were working at the Bible college uh, and we didn't like the fact that we had to pay $9 a day to have our meals provided. And so we came up with this great plan, me and uh, two buddies, uh, the three stooges really. And we came before him and says, hey, here's the deal. Uh, we want that $9, and we'll find a way to get our own food. And he just, I'm sure, just laughed and said, go for it, knock yourself out, but you can't come into the kitchen. You can't come into the dining hall whatsoever at all. No problem there. So we went back, and we went down to Vaughn's and bought our tortillas and peanut butter and jelly, and we're going to make this work for four weeks to prove our point. Stupid kids. <laughs> it lasted about a week, because after that, you're kind of sick and tired of peanut butter and jelly, Right? And then you're telling your friends, hey, can you sneak me some food? Of course, we got caught with that. That didn't turn out so well. We finally made it through. We were starving at the end and finally made it through because, you know, you're college kids. You've got to prove your point. But I will never again do that in my life. And hopefully there's wisdom passed on uh, for, for anybody that is thinking that that's the best way to prove your point uh, by going on a hunger strike. You're really only affecting yourself. But here were these men. They were serious about this, as we are going to take out Paul. Verse 14, they come before the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will not eat until we have killed Paul. Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make a further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. They have thought this thing through. They've looked at every angle and thought, okay, here's the best way to do this. The priests will get off scot-free. They know nothing about it. They can deny all facts. We're going to take him out in the middle of the night under the darkness. No one will ever know. It's foolproof. It's fantastic. It's great. Let's go for it. And you just might note this. 
And though the enemy comes up with his plans, we serve a God that is not only strong, but stronger. And he is able to defend and defeat the work of the enemy. Sometimes you feel, in a sense, like Paul, okay, I am pinned down in the prison. There is nothing I can do. There's no angles I can work to kind of get out of this. I am simply at the mercy of God and the things that I am hearing. And you're going, Lord, what's next? How do we deal with this? What are we supposed to do in the midst of this? You're pinned, like Moses at the Red Sea, and we all know that account, and there he was with the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. He's got the sea before him. He's got the mountains pinning him in to each side, and the, uh, the enemy Pharaoh coming from behind. What do you do? And the people are freaking out, panicking. He turns to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord simply says, Mo, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's going to take care of the enemy. And of course, we know what happened. He opened the sea, swallowed them all up, and the people praised God. But it's really the first lesson as we look at this, this whole thing of standing under conspiracy. Number one is to stand strong because man's plans do not stop God's promises. Amen? Oh, there's times when those plans can look really threatening, really big, but they have nothing in comparison to the promises that God has made. And it's for us to note, you may not have a way of escape, so to speak, but God always provides a way of escape, and that is in turning to him and releasing it into his hands. There are times, I've seen it in my life, I'm sure you've seen it in yours, but there are times when God will allow a situation into your life that if you were to stamp it, there's only two words, I can't, boom. Boom. I can't do anything, I can't plan anything, I can't move, it's, I'm in over my head. And sometimes God uses those circumstances to bring us to the point of realizing I need to look to him and just trust in him. The psalmist writes, where does my help come from? My help comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. I'm looking to you, God, not myself and what I can figure out. I'm just pinned in and pinned down. But I know that your promises stand far greater than any plan man could come up with. There was King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He's a godly king. You read the Bible and you see these kings and some of them grieve your heart and others of them, you just go, man, there's a guy I want to follow. Well, here was a guy at the time following the Lord and the Ammonites and the Moabites were coming against Israel. And he realized his own limitations, his own weakness, his own inability, and said, Lord, I, I can't. He says there in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, O oh, our God, we, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Many times you'll be in the place similar to that, if not before soon, because that's just the way life is with the Lord. He puts us in impossible situations so that we see the possible God that we serve. But our eyes are on you, Lord. You know it's a great multitude. It's a plan that seems so big. I don't see any way out, but my eyes are on you. And the word of the Lord given to him in that time, in verse 15, it says, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Oh, man, we need to hear that. We need to hear that often. The battle's not yours. It's the Lord's. The battle belongs to the Lord. And the Lord told him, I want you guys to go out to the battlefield. I want you to face the enemy, so to speak, and know that the victory is going to come from the Lord. And so when they went out to the battlefield, the king ordered them, I want you guys to just praise the Lord as you go out. Strike up the worship band. We're going to let the right perspective in this whole issue that God is exalted far above the enemy. We have no idea what's going to happen, but the Lord, as we praise the Lord, guess what? God was proving himself and doing the work because they got to the, where the battle was to take place. They looked out and all they saw was dead bodies. Dead bodies because the Lord in the middle of the night had stirred them up against each other and they attacked each other. You see, they got to the place where the battle was to go and it wasn't the fears that they had to deal with anymore and it wasn't the inabilities. All they had to do was see the Lord's work. 
God brings the plans of the enemy to deadness. They're fruitless. They're powerless in light of who the Lord is. As Isaiah says, no weapon formed against me will prosper. My place is to turn to him, to trust in him, to walk in obedience to his will. His place, his part, he's going to take care of the rest. Listen, if God knows when a sparrow falls, and God knows when the grass is here today and gone tomorrow, Jesus says, doesn't our Father care even more about you? Oh, but Lord, this is impossible. That's right, it's impossible from your perspective, but not mine. So men may threat, but God's promises still stand. And look at verse 16. So when Paul's sister's son, this is Paul's nephew, heard of the ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. And Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Then the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them. For more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. How did this young man hear about these things? We don't know. Maybe it was visiting hours and he heard, overheard something taking place. We don't know. But when the world looks at it and says, oh, Paul, you're in luck. Oh, what a coincidence. We know, no, no, no. Our God is greater than coincidences and luck. He is ordering things. And he placed this young kid there at the right time to overhear this, to then go to his uncle Paul and then end up in the office of the commander to present what he heard. God was working behind the scenes in a very real, in a very radical way. Lesson number two is that we need to stand still. God is going to do things and deliver in his own way. He's working, as you are wondering, watching, and just waiting on God to do something. He's working. He really is. Here are these men, these grown men with this foolproof plan. It looks like they have thought through everything, that this is a full-on, it's going to happen and the Lord says, oh yeah, watch this. Ooh, didn't see that one coming. I didn't consider that God would use a little boy in this process. A kid. He uses a, a kid to deliver the, the, the missionary of the time, Paul. It seems that he was a young enough person because it says in verse 19 that the commander took him by the hand but at the same time, he seems to have his thoughts together as it's portrayed there. The plan is revealed. Um, but he's a young man. A young man. 1 Corinthians 1, 25 tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God stronger than men. God's ways are not like the world's ways, are they? And God shows the foolishness of men by the simplicity in God. He takes this kid. God uses kids. And kids, listen up. God wants to use you. When you look through the Bible, you see multitudes of times where God took little children to teach great lessons to adults. And God uses little kids. I mean, when the world is saying, get out of here, kid, you bother me. The Lord is saying, no, no, no. Let the children come unto me because I want to teach the world a lesson through these kids. You think about it. Jesus took a little boy's Lunchable, his Happy Meal, and went out and fed 5,000 people with that. Thanks, little boy. We'll see you in heaven. Hello, my name is the little boy who gave a lunch. I don't know his name. We look at, we look at someone like when Jesus came in to uh, that Palm Sunday, and there he was, and the crowds are crying out, Hosanna, and the children are crying out the praises of this one. And the, the Pharisees say, hey, tell, this, tell these people to stop. Tell them to shut up. And the Lord says, No. They be quiet, even the rocks are going to cry out. This is an appointed day. Because even in Psalms 8, it said, Out of the mouth of babes you will perfect praise and you'll silence 
the mouth of the enemies. We look at guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who stood strong in their young days before the fires of Nebuchadnezzar. They purposed in their heart they're not going to defile themselves with the king's food. And what a lesson for us to learn. We look at a slave girl that happened to be in, uh, in the country of Naaman the leper, the Assyrian general, and she says, she says to him one day because he was suffering from leprosy, well, you go back to my land and you ask for a guy named Elijah and the God of Israel can heal you. And God used the slave girl to take this mighty general to a place where he could hear about the greatness of Jehovah God. And on and on and on, we find these examples in Scripture of God using kids to teach the world a lesson because the foolishness that they see is the tool that God wants to use. There's not many mighty that are called, right? Not many noble and strong and wise that we would go, oh yeah, now I understand why God uses that guy. Oh, I understand why God uses her. I mean, she's just cut out for the part. The Lord says, watch this. You just give me a willing vessel and I'll fill him with the Holy Spirit and we will go out and do great things. So here's this young boy in place. He probably doesn't even know what's going on exactly. I'm just the messenger. I don't have the power to deliver. I'm just delivering the message and the commander has to do something with it. They are ready, he says in verse 21. They're waiting for the promise from you. And the commander at this point could have said, hey, silly boy, tricks are for kids. Go back home and eat some choco stuff. You know, lucky charms are waiting there. This is big boy business. I'm a soldier. You're just a wee little lad. You go back home to your mom. But he took it as truth. Now, why would he take it as truth and not just cast it off? Maybe because of what transpired already. These guys are nuts. These Jewish people, man, they did want to kill this guy in the first place. There was a mob in the temple. He brings up the word resurrection in front of the Jewish council, and they all go nuts again. They want to kill him. These guys are crazy. So maybe there is some substance to what this kid is saying. As he's watched all this transpire, but he begins to move. Here's what I love. He didn't say, you know what, I'm going to think about that. Thanks for sharing that with me, kid. Eh, maybe I'll deal with that in the morning. There was something that gripped his heart. I'll tell you what it was. It was the Holy Spirit. Because God was working behind the scenes to protect and preserve Paul and his witness. And the Lord was putting this boy in the right place at the right time to deal with this commander. God was moving upon the heart of this commander in these things. George Mueller, you know who he is? He was a guy who lived in the 1800s, a great man of faith. The Lord used in a mighty way. You pick up his, his biography and uh, you, you'll see just a great encouragement. But on his desk, he had this sign. It said this, it matters to him about you. It matters to him about you. And here was a man encouraged by the Lord as he supported tens of thousands of orphans strictly by prayer. As he walked with God and the Lord used him in a mighty way, he took every issue back to prayer and realizing that God was concerned with the things that he was dealing with on a regular basis. I wonder, are you convinced of that? That God understands what you're going through but also knows what he is doing. It's, he's not taking things by surprise. He's not planning it as he goes. He knows exactly what's taking place. Oh, Lord, I got this family situation. I got this issue going on. It matters to him about you. Lord, I got this work situation. I don't know if I'm going to have a job by next week. I don't know what's going on. It matters to him about you. You are not in the place of God. You are the servant of God, the child of God, but just like a father loves his kids and is concerned with what's taking place in the lives of his kids, we see it physically. How much more our heavenly father, who loves us eternally, who bought us with his very blood is going to say, what you're facing matters to me. It's Psalms 138, verse 8. The Lord will perfect, it means to complete, to bring to a fulfillment and a finish that which concerns me. Your, your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And you're going to have times, I've had times where you feel like, Lord, you, maybe you have forsaken me. Maybe, God, you don't really care. That's the feelings that talk. 
because God's not working in the way that you thought he should. But in those times, I really want to encourage you to stop, to be still, to stand still, to stand strong, and remember the faithfulness of your God in the past, in your life. Because what you're saying right now, Lord, does it really matter to you? You've said before in situations in the past, and you've watched God work in such a way that in the end, you went, oh, Lord, you really do all things well. You really are working far greater than what I can see. Help me next time to trust you. And we find ourselves in that place, God, do you care? The Lord says, hey, look at what I've done before. Let that be the pattern. Lord, it does matter to you. And I can honestly say, God, you will protect and preserve. You are faithful to complete the work that you've started. And you'll finish it. And so, Lord, I can trust you in my day-to-day issues that come up because you're always in charge. And Paul is at that place right now where he's having to trust the Lord. And look at what happens, verse 23. And then he called for two centurions. This is the commander saying, prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea, which is on the coast there, at the third hour of the night, 9 p.m., midnight run taking place, and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman, And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipas, Antipatris, and the next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. What is this guy doing? He hears this truth and he is moving. Number one, he is preparing. He is preparing an escape for Paul. He rallies his troops together. Notice that he says there he's got two centurions, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, a horse for Paul, a partridge in a pear tree and whatever else is needed. This guy, you think and you go, wow, that's, is that overboard? You got 470 soldiers for this one guy to take him to this place? Well, as he traveled along that way, there were cracks in the cliffs and the hills where people could hide out. And so it was, in a sense, guerrilla warfare could be. And so he's preparing. It's tense times. He's preparing an escape for Paul. But he's not only preparing an escape, he's also pinning this letter. Because a a lower Roman official, according to Roman law, you would never just send a prisoner. You would have to send a letter with it to state the reasons why you're sending this guy. And that's what he's doing. Obviously, you send someone in the middle of the night, you better have something. (laughs) They start knocking on the door. What are you doing here? Why couldn't you wait till the morning? And so that's what he's doing. He's pinning this letter. And he points out in this letter this predicament of Paul on one hand. But he's also kind of building himself up a little bit. He leaves some things out. I mean, this is politics. It's always happened. And when you look at this letter, you find him saying things like, I rescued him when I learned that he was a Roman. And he didn't mention in there that you almost flogged the guy and could be called on account of that. But we'll leave that one out because he doesn't need to know about that. Oh, I rescued him. And verse 28, I sought reasons for their actions. I was just trying to figure out what's going on. And then verse 30, I found out about this plot. And, and no, the plot kind of came to you through a little boy. But you can't say that as a general, as a commander telling, you know, the next up in line. But he's, in a sense, he's bringing him to, to Felix and saying, here, here's your problem now. <laughs> you take him. That's what he did. But Claudius is acting upon what he heard. And it's really that third lesson is to stand steady and just watch God work it all out. As you have no idea what God's going to do, there's a point where you, in stopping and just observing, saying, hmm, this is interesting, Lord. It's interesting how you deal with the enemy with the, through a young boy. Never saw that coming, God. That was pretty cool. But it's also interesting how you're moving upon a general to prepare an army and pen a letter for me to build a testimony that you would be faithful to finish your work and fulfill your promise. 
Go, God. That's good. Store those things in your heart. You need them for the trials and issues you face. So when they got as far as Antipas, Antipatris, which was 40 miles from Jerusalem, there part of the, the troops went back and the next day a few went on and all the way to Caesarea where the governor was. Uh, he was along the coast. Felix was the governor. Uh, he ruled from AD 52 to 59. And it's been said that he was the only slave in the Roman history that actually came up and became in a position of a governor. His, his brother, Paulos was a friend of Caesar Nero, and so he won the favor through him. But Tacitus, the, the historian, says that Felix executed the prerogatives of a king with the spirit of a slave. He was kind of paying back the world for his upbringing, getting even, so to speak. And Paul is here in his house. He has no choice. I guess it's a good place where he's here in Caesarea. But notice what it says there. Uh, verse 33, when they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. He's investigating to see if this guy is in his area, his jurisdiction. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, there that area up, up north, uh, modern day Turkey in that area, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Now understand this. Herod's Praetorium was not a dungeon. It was not a jail. It was a house that Herod had built there on the sea. There on the Mediterranean Sea, his beach house. Guess what, Paul? We're moving you into a little vacay for the next two years. You get to kick it at the old beach house. You see the blessing in disguise? As you're watching God just kind of work out his will, Along the way, the Lord wants to give you little nuggets, little blessings to go watch. I'm, I'm still involved here. And Paul spends the next two years in this house by the sea. It's definitely an interesting time for him. The Jews are against him. The Romans are preserving him, protecting him. And Paul can only sit back and just trust that the Lord is in control. That the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. Men can plan what they want, but the promises of God stand. God will deliver, but let him do it in his way. And lastly, be steady and watch God work it out. One last personal story. When I was living in North Korea, uh, North Korea when I was living in China on the border of North Korea, um, they had told us numerous times, hey, watch out because there are Chinese government spies or North Korean spies that are uh, around following you guys who are Americans. They want to know why are there Americans? Why are these um, white people in our land? These Americans obviously are not the best friends with North Koreans and such and the Chinese as well. And so you're always watching out, kind of looking over your shoulder, watching what you're doing um, because... You know, it's just the place that it was. And I would never forget one day when this lady came running up to me, didn't even introduce herself, but in perfect English says, can I have a Bible? And I was like, you know, I'm just walking down the road. Can I have a Bible? Where's a church? You know a good church that I could go to and this, that, and the other. And, and I, I just remember at that time um, just going, I think there's a church there. There's a church right there. Maybe they have a Bible. Because you're not just going to come out and go, hey, I got one in my backpack. What do you think? Hey, want to know Jesus? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. Especially in heeding the warnings. And then she says, well, can I meet with you? I said, no. <laughs> I said, but you can meet with my wife. I wasn't throwing her under the bus. I was just saying, you know, it's probably better that way. And she, she never called. But she kept saying over and over, can I have a Bible? Can I have a Bible? Can I have a Bible? You got a Bible for me. And I walked away from that situation going, what was that, Lord? Was that a situation where this person was truly, you know, uh, uh, wanting to know Christ and wanting to get plugged in? Or, or was that a bait and hook type of thing because of the situations I heard? I don't know. But the peace in my heart was simply this. God, you're in control. My part's to trust in you. Your part is do what you will. And in the end, you see the hand of God work things out for his glory and for your protection.